Chapter 20 Portrait Dusk approached with lightning speed, casting a muted purple hue over the backyard. As the shadows lengthened on the ground, Faddy hurried to get ready. A mere half-hour window remained to capture the image before him. He pressed the latch on the right side of the camera and opened its back. Faddy popped in a new roll of film and threaded it into the take-up spool. He paused a moment to run a finger along the camera's sleek, shiny lines, so different from his old, beat-up Minolta. He cast a grateful look over to Arne as she helped him organise a photo shoot. No time to waste. He snapped the back of the camera shut and chose the appropriate shutter and aperture settings, which controlled the amount of light the film would be exposed to. Shooting at this time of day was tricky, and he needed artificial light to balance out the fading glow of the sun. With Carl and Anufa's permission, Fadi and Zalme had dragged two tall lamps onto the patio. Zalme had plugged them in and positioned them behind Fadi's back, on the right. The illumination from the lamps accompanied the fading sunlight, while the slight angle of the lamplight created soft shadows across his subjects. Fadi shot Arn a thankful smile as she pulled her tripod out of the duffel bag. She'd arrived 15 minutes earlier, dragging her camera and equipment with her. Do you need another lens? asked Arn. No, this one works great, said Fadi, grabbing the tripod. To accommodate the muted light, Faddy needed to hold the camera as steady as possible and use a longer shutter speed. Are you ready? Faddy called out to the two people sitting in front of him. I think so, Bake, said Dada. It had taken Faddy half an hour to convince Uncle Armin's elderly parents, Dada and Abe, to pose for him, but finally they'd agreed. It was flipping through Clive Murray's bio that had given Faddy the idea to do a portrait shoot. He'd read that of all subjects, people made the best photographs, since nothing fascinated humans more than looking at other people. A good people photograph showed character and emotion, creating a bond with the viewer. And Abe and Dada had an amazing character in their faces. Years of marriage, love, loss, trials and tribulations were written in every wrinkle, line, spot and curve on their faces. Their faces were maps of their lives. Dada sat a bit stiffly, looking around at the equipment with a frown. He wore traditional Afghan clothes and a bright colourful cap covered his balding head. Abe sat next to him, shrouded in a gauzy white scarf, as if hiding from the camera. Fadi had positioned the couple on a low bench framed in the back by the shadow of the overgrown rose bushes. He knew that, unlike the human eye, photographic film didn't easily handle bright whites and stark blacks so the shade provided by the bushes created various tones of grey that were easier for the film to absorb. Faddy added the flash to brighten the subject's faces. Anything more I can do to help? asked Arn. Zalme hovered behind him, carrying extra film. No, it's perfect, thanks, responded Faddy. He shooed the younger kids back to the sliding glass doors. They tumbled out of the house, intrigued by all the commotion. With curious eyes, they watched sucking lollipops Faddy had given them to gain their cooperation. Faddy looked through the viewfinder and framed Abe and Dada in the little square. But he didn't want to fall into the pitfall many photographers fell into, shooting a subject's entire body head to toe. He knew that when taking a portrait shot, the face, especially the eyes and the mouth, were the key elements. So Faddy fed Abe and Dada's head into the shot and pulled back. He stopped when he'd cropped them to their shoulders. The viewfinder sought each line in Arbe and Dada's faces, which told the tale of the life they had led, filled with joy, pain, challenge and triumph. He pressed the shutter button and took a dozen or so shots. Something isn't quite right, he thought. Arbe and Dada were too formal. They appeared uncomfortable, like they didn't want to be there. Arbe, Dada, he called out, please try to relax. Think of something fun. Something funny, maybe. Dada nodded and smiled while Abe lowered her scarf from around her mouth. She looked at the camera nervously, and Faddy took a couple more shots. These were better, but not great. Saha, he called out. Can you do a dance or something for Abe and Dada? Saha puffed out her cheeks and shook her head. Look, I'll get you guys ice cream for Mr. Singh's truck. The kids looked at one another and whispered. Faddy tapped his foot, looking up at the darkening sky. Two ice creams, 
said Saha. Highway robbery, thought Faddy, but agreed. Time was running out. The kids stood under the lamps and started acting like monkeys, howling and hooting and scratching under their arms. Abe and Dada laughed at their antics and relaxed a bit. Darn, not the look I'm going for. But Faddy continued to shoot. In the middle, he replaced the roll with a fresh one. And finally, as the sun was about to sink into the horizon, he called it a night. This was it, as good as it was going to get. Thank you, Abe. Dada, I'm done, Faddy called out. Relieved, the elderly couple stood up from the bench. In the process, Abe's scarf got caught in the rose bushes. Dada grinned, revealing a strong set of white teeth. With gnarled hands stricken with arthritis, he gently unhooked the scarf and broke off a large yellow bloom and handed it to her. Abe giggled like a young girl and took a sniff of the rose. Faddy froze. This is perfect. He refocused the lens and started clicking just as the sun fired a last burst of golden light over the yard before fading into the horizon. Abe and Dada were oblivious to those around them as they chatted softly to each other. Click, click, click. Abe's face was wreathed in happiness as Dada smiled. Elation flooded Faddy's heart. He knew that these were some of the best pictures he'd ever taken. Faddy carried his lunch tray through the rowdy cafeteria, oblivious to the noise around him. He just handed his entry form and picture to Miss Bethuna five hours before his deadline. He was exhausted and thrilled at the same time. I'm going to win, I just know it. He stopped near the vending machines and spotted the table he usually sat out with Arne, John, Ravi and a couple of the other kids from the photo club. It was empty. He was the first one there. He was about to sit down when he heard his name being called from behind him. He turned, peering across the table with the basketball players next to the science fair geeks. Faddy, repeated the voice. A group of boys sat next to the band kids. The one who had called his name was Masood, the Afghan boy he'd seen at the market the day his father had had his outburst. Hey, Faddy, said the other Afghan boy with his math class. Aren't you a Puktan? Faddy froze. He realised that they were both Tajiks. The entire table was Tajik or Uzbek. They probably wanted to beat him up after what his father had said. Sweat beaded between his shoulder blades. They probably blamed the problems in Afghanistan and the attack on the US on the Taliban and the Puktans. He gingerly put one foot back, ready to turn around and run. Fadi, repeated Masood. He impatiently waved him towards the table. Fadi looked around the crowded room. Have some pride, he berated himself. Don't be a coward. It's not like they can beat you up in front of all these people. Bracing himself with a deep breath and a prayer, he strode towards the table. Yeah, I'm Pukton, Fadi said. He stood straight and met Masood's probing dark eyes. Tough guys, those Puktans, said the pudgy kid in an oversized cow sweatshirt. I'm Zaid, he added with a wave. Uh, hi Zaid, said Fadi. Take a seat, said Masood, making room next to him. Fadi set his tray between Masood and Zaid and sat down. We heard you got jumped by Ike and Felix, said Masood. Fadi nodded. His face still sported faded purplish-yellow bruises. We also heard you gave them a dose of their own medicine, said Zaid with a huge grin. Those guys deserve it, mumbled a kid who was sitting across the table. His mouth was full of kebab sandwich. Yeah, man, piped in another boy. Did you see Ike's busted lip? They've been bossing everyone around for years, said Masood. And now, now they've got them worse. They're going around calling everyone a terrorist, even the Indian and Mexican kids. Yeah, like oppressing people, man, said the kebab sandwich eater. Faddy nodded and carefully opened his carton of orange juice. Oppressing people is right. He knew Felix had tried to shake Ravi down for money last week. Poor Ravi had nearly peed in his pants and passed out. Time for us to join forces, dudes, said Masood. He patted Faddy on the back. Time for us to give them some of their own medicine. Realising he could finally get revenge, Faddy looked at the guys and smiled. What do you have in mind? <laughs>